Swarmers. Welcome back to The Hive. In our recent video on sustainable seafood, we talked about aquaculture projects having the potential to rebuild marine ecosystems and promote biodiversity. One such project taking place in New York Harbor is Billion Oyster Project, whose ambitious goal is to restore 1 billion live oysters to New York Harbor by 2035. We are lucky to have Danielle Bissett, the Assistant Director of Restoration at Billion Oyster with us today to learn more. Hi Danielle, thanks for being here. Hi, thanks for having me. Looking forward to learning so much. Um, let's start by learning about you. What is, tell us a little bit about your background and how eventually you found your way to sustainability. Sure. Um, yeah, so growing up, I was, you know, I always got kicked out of the house. I was, um, I'm the youngest of four kids. Uh, so during the summer, especially, we, my mom would just be like, go out, play, get out of here. We were never really allowed to sit down and, and watch TV and, and just kind of waste the day. Yeah, so I would be, I, I just had such a interest and I felt so, so alive, um, you know, climbing in trees, like riding my bike through, through like this little meadow we have. Um, and just then like hanging out and, and embracing the, the environment I was in. And of course, at that time, you know, I was uh, playing with my friends and we were making up like all these different scenarios and pretending we lived here. And so I just have such fond memories growing up and being outdoors. Um, we would go to the beach almost every weekend. And these were like full beach days. Like we would get in the car at 7 a.m., leave and be home at the end of the day by like 8 p.m., and so it was just like wow. these full long days of just being outside all the time. Um, and so it's really funny because when I was actually trying to decide my major in undergrad, I, I was very drawn to the social sciences with like understanding psychology and sociology. And I was really interested in anthropology. Um, but I just had like this little itch still. I'm like, I feel like I'm not there yet. And then um, I started... I, it was kind of just sitting in my face. It was just like environmental science. And I'm like, yes, this is what I want to do. Um, so that's what I, I actually got my degree in both environmental studies and anthropology. Um, hmm. And so I just really love the idea of living with nature, you know, like when you're hmm. driving through, um, you know, like random cities that like you're, you're driving upstate and you just see, oh, here's a town now. Um, and seeing, you know, like, it, it's old school um, design with like plowing out the road, like the, the trees or whatever was there and, and putting your town there and building on top of nature. But mm -hmm. there are sometimes like more recently that I've been driving through some, some parts and I like they're, they're building into nature. Mm -hmm. They're, they're building with it um, and they're building into the landscape and not just bulldozing it and putting what they want. So they're really taking into account what's already there and how to build off of it um, and make it more sustainable. So I've always had this idea that I've, I've really just wanted to be working in the environment, working for the environment, working with people, working for people, and bringing those two things together constantly. Um, I started after grad school, um, I, got, I got my master's in environmental policy. So again, another layer um, mm -hmm. environment and social, but com completely from a different perspective. Um, and after that journey, I started um, really my career at the New York City Parks Department with the Natural Resources Group. And um, it was through a Conservation Corps fellowship program um, that lasted 10 months, very similar to other 10 month long programs that kind of place you into different agencies or schools. Um, and this um, just really opened my eyes to what was happening in New York City um, from, from that perspective, from an environmental perspective, from a social perspective, and, and bringing these two things together. Um, so it was just really exciting to be like, oh, this is, I thought I would have to like move out of New York, like off, because I grew up on Long Island. So mm -hmm. I thought I would have to move to like somewhere far away to do the work I wanted to do. <laughs> And, you know, it's right here. So it was, that's really convenient. I don't, like, my family is here. I don't have to leave. <laughs> and um, I can enjoy, you know, the city and um, everything that 
goes along with it. Um, and all the while trying to restore um, the environment. And so that started out in the Bronx River with um, watershed wide projects, focusing on you know, slowing the water down and letting it absorb. We have so many impervious surfaces in the city um, and throughout all boroughs. And so I was stationed in the Bronx River. Many of, all of my projects were focused on the Bronx River watershed. And um, it was just such a, an amazing thing, an amazing place to start my career working on those projects. Um, we also, I also worked on a fish passage. It was the first fish passage in New York City um, on the Bronx River. So yeah, so it was really cool getting, you know, working to re restore this like natural historical um, river herring run from the ocean to the Bronx River. They go to other rivers as well, but they're seeking out fresh water to spawn each, each year. Um, and so I was a part of that and getting that off the ground and um, working on American eel restoration projects as well, getting them up and over dams and understanding what their, um, how many eels were in the Bronx River and doing some monitoring and data collection. And then of course I was um, introduced to the oyster restoration projects that um, were at the mouth of the Bronx River. So it's really interesting too, to kind of see like I, the Bronx River is actually the only freshwater river in New York City. So of course the Hudson River is freshwater, but it's not in the um, boundary of New York City. Um, so this is um, a pretty mm -hmm. unique space. So I was working in freshwater systems and brackish and like saltwater systems as well. So it was just, I just had an array of all these projects and what, what struck me the most with these was the oyster restoration project and knowing how much was or could be built on top of the foundation of oysters just blew my mind. So I really wanted to figure out a way to work more closely with oysters and more focused on oysters. Um, and then a spot at the Billion Oyster Project opened up and here I am. <laughs> oh, perfect. Can you start off by telling us a little bit about the history of New York Harbor? Yes, it's a lot of history, <laughs> um, but very specific to, um, you know, oyster reefs. There were, you know, about 220,000 acres of oyster reefs before, you know, New York City is what it is today. Um, so, you know, just try to imagine a really beautiful biodiverse like hot spot that you want to travel to and that's what New York Harbor was. It had whales, mm -hmm. dolphins, seals, everything that you can imagine, everything that you could see in the marine environment um, and then more on you know on land. And so, so starting off it was incredibly diverse, incredibly um, um, abundant and lush and um, also New York City is situated in a very diverse geographic um, place as well. Yeah. So we have a lot of different um, micro ecosystems too. And like there's a beautiful project called the Manahatta Project, which I'm sure many people are familiar with that kind of jump into all of those different habitats. So oysters were incredibly abundant. They're really termed the ecosystem engineer. They're the they were the foundation of all of that biodiversity because they created an ecosystem through their clustering and through them cementing to each other and growing out and on top of each other. So they not only provided food and shelter, but they also um, stabilized and, and protected the shore. So, so this whole, this, you know, historical um, environment was just very stable, very stable, very, you know, present. And then once um, we started, you know, colonizing uh, New York, we started, you know, changing the landscape, um, so that created more pollution. And then we also started eating, eating a lot of these oysters as well. And all of this is happening at the same time. And as we started ur urbanizing more and more, um, we were realizing that we weren't able to eat the oysters that much anymore because of water pollution and sewage and whatnot going into the the environment. Um, and so, kind of the 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 final downfall of the oyster, if you want to call it that, was, you know, in um, the early 1900s where the last oyster um, farm was really shut down. Um, 
the last oyster beds, sorry, should I say we're mostly oyster men at that time, were, were farming and collecting um, oysters from the water. So um, those were shut down due to, you know, I think it was typhoid disease. Somebody got it and unfortunately wow. passed away. So it was kind of like really big headlines. <laughs> um, and yeah. instead of, you know, making the decision to clean up the water, we were like, no, we can't harvest oysters from these waters anymore. So that's kind of like what Ugh. the harbor used to be and where we are today. So it's a bit of a, a bummer, but there's also good things happening <laughs> there, you yeah. know, the Clean Water Act and um, a lot of these other um, key federal and state um, environmental laws. Um, that's really brought back a lot of what we're seeing today, currently today, with, with the water quality improving and also with whales and dolphins returning to these waters. Oh, which is and amazing. of course, oysters. We find wild oysters um, throughout the harbor. Yeah. And another one of those great things is you guys. So um, that's a great segue. How can, uh, tell us about how Billion Oyster Project began its efforts in sustainability and in this, this world. So the, the primary areas that we work in, like true sustainability, um, if we want to phrase it, um, and, and we could talk about the history of Billion Oyster Project and, you know, where, where we are today as an organization, but focusing in on, on our sustainable efforts are um, our shell collection program. So there's two things, our shell collection program, and uh, we're trying to move away from plastic bags that we set our oysters into. Mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to move away from plastics and embrace more of these biodegradable bags, um, but it's a work in progress, of course. So on the first note of the shell collection program, we have collected um, about 1.5 million pounds of shell. And so that's shell that would have been going to landfills and taking up a lot of space. <laughs> yeah, holy moly. Yeah, so we work with um, 75 restaurants throughout the city to um, have them separate the oysters, the oyster shell from their trash. And they put it in trash cans that we provide, they lock and we do our best to reduce the smell because they have to hold it for a few days at a time because they have weekly pickups. What exactly then do you do with those shells? How is that a sustainable uh, practice? So let's just start at the source. So we have our oyster farmers that are, you know, um, they have their oyster farm and they're growing these uh, amazing oysters and ecosystem engineers and they're obviously selling them for food. But a side note, oyster farms are probably one of the, like if you look at all of the animal farms in the world and the sustain sustainability and environmental issues surrounding those, um, oyster farms are probably the only great farm that, that has pros. And I'm sure there's a few cons, but it has more pros that, than, than any other animal farm could have. Like I said, they're, they're ecosystem engineers, so they're attracting all of these, these other species into the farmer's cove or wherever they have their um, farm set up. Um, so they're attracting these species and, um, you know, oysters spawn. They, nobody can control that. Um, so there might be um, more wild oysters in that area now because of that farm just existing there. Um, so, and then it's filtered water and all these great things. So you're, it's a truly great farm. Um, and then the other pro is that, you know, somebody can make their livelihood off of this and sell these oysters to, to us, to everybody. And um, they're a great clean source of protein. And um, like I said, there are tremendous amounts of uh, benefits just from that farm existing. But back to <laughs> the shell collection Sorry. and yeah, yeah, where the shells come from. Um, so, so once the oysters sell those, um, oh, once the oysters, once the farmers <laughs> sell those oysters, <laughs> they make their way to restaurants. We, and that's where we come in with the shell collection program and with our oyster hours and our socializing. Then once we accumulate enough at our, um, it's called, it's almost like a, uh, what are they called in the garbage world? Like a, a, a transport hub or something like that where it's, um, they're they compile a bunch of trash and then they transport it elsewhere. I'm yeah. blanking on the word, but um, that works, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so once we accumulate enough, then we bring it on to Governor's Island and we have curing locations. So that means our shell gets um, 
spread out so that it's not too, too thick in piles. And um, it will sit out for about a year um, to basically get cleaned by the elements. So that includes rain, um, wind, uh, water, and of course the little critters on Governor's Island that love to eat the remaining bits of oyster on the shell. Uh, mostly rats is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so the curing process happens for about a year and once they're ready to be used, um, sorry, as that is happening, that curing process is happening, parallel to that we're designing projects, we're getting permitting, our permits in, uh, we're fabricating structures with New York Harbor students, New York Harbor School students and our volunteers and our corporate volunteers and our schools. I know the list goes on. Um, yeah. And um, and then we our shell is, you know, a year later clean and ready to be used. Um, and then we fill that shell into our structures, which we then put into our oyster tanks and set baby oysters to those uh, cleaned shells. Um, and then it goes out to the harbor at one of our permitted oyster sites. So, um, so yeah, it's a pretty exciting process. The reason why I said it's not a full circle because you cannot harvest oysters in New York Harbor because of the raw sewage issue. So, right, I see. So, so if you could, it could have been a closed loop system. Yeah, yeah. Well, that one would have been nice and tidy, but it's okay. It's great. Right. Otherwise, in anywhere else, you could ideally harvest those oysters that you put back in the water and they'd be back on a consumer's plate. So that's, that's really cool. I love this, that your founders, Murray and Pete, believe that restoration without education is temporary. Mm -hmm. And I just love that, that sentiment, that idea, because I think it's true for so many things, right? It, it, it can only go so far with the people who are doing the work right now. You yeah. know, you have to spread the knowledge, keep it going, you know? <laughs> So that's really, really wonderful. Is there anything else that you can share with us about those education initiatives? There are, you know, there's so many um, existing education initiatives and they're like with COVID-19, um, we've had to like revamp everything and um, the ed team, the education team that is at Billion Oyster Project, they've completely um, like done a, not, not like a, a 180, but they've they've really adapted well to yeah. the current environment, and they've been putting out so many amazing videos and putting together really great lesson plans. That um, you know, whoever's whoever's teaching right now, whether you're a parent or you're an actual teacher, or you know, you're a grandparent or a cousin or whoever, your sister, whatever, um, you can use these tools to help keep students of many different age groups engaged in their work because right now you know we all know that it's really difficult to be a student at this time um, yeah so so they've um, really provided great resources during you know today's current climate um, to help get students through and support them some other really amazing things that the ed education team does is they engage students and teachers through something called an oyster research station um, and it is basically a, a wire mesh cage um, that you can hold in your hands and you can um, tie, it, tie a rope to it and hang it from a pier. So it's a fixed station and you as a student or you as a teacher can go and pull this up, then you get to explore what's in it. And of course there's oysters in it. Um, and like I said, oysters attract a bunch of other organisms to them. Uh, mostly mobile organisms, so not mostly, but those are the creatures that, you know, most students get really excited about. Yeah, sure. Um, but so it's really tricky sometimes depending on where that or ORS station is, like while you're pulling it up, a lot of those organisms can fall out, but most of them make it. And so it, when you get in, into a bucket and you're exploring what's in there, you know, you're using your hands, you're smelling, you're seeing, you're experiencing so many, um, you know, you're using all of your senses to yeah. learn. Um, and it's incredibly empowering and it's a really beautiful way to engage students and teachers at the waterfront and um, really get them exploring what's in, what's in the water because so many people look at the water and they just think like, oh, it's, 
it's a river or, oh, yeah. that's just water, whatever. I don't, nothing's in there. It's unknown. Yeah, I can't see through it. I'm a little scared of it, whatever. Whatever yeah. the case is, people usually turn away from it and yeah. they don't really think about what's in there or they just don't think anything is in there. So this is just a really great way to um, really um, help students experience the water in a city, right? Yeah. That's really hard to access because, you know, we have bulkheads, we have buildings, we have um, industrial zones along the waterfront that eat yeah. up all of this beautiful space. Such um, a range of things. It's yeah. really incredible work you guys are doing. That's, that's really exciting. Yeah. Let's talk about climate change. Oh, um, yay. <laughs> how are you discovering that it's affecting Billion Oyster Project's efforts? What are the challenges you're facing of trying to restore the face of our new era of superstorms, you know? And will rebuilding of reefs be helpful as waters rise? So, of course, like things like um, ocean acidification are real threats to um, any calcium carbonate creature in the water. So as the um, ocean becomes more acid based, that level of acid will actually um, like break down and erode the oyster shell. Um, in addition to mussels, in addition to any bivalve, any, any creature that's using calcium carbonate. And so that's a real threat. Luckily though, the, the oyster is a pretty flexible creature. So um, coral reefs, for example, are incredibly sensitive to any major shift. Um, whereas oysters, there again, there is um, some negative impacts, but they do have a wider range of physical conditions that they can live within. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, even as you go towards, you know, a more acid environment, it's still not good for them, but they can at least still live. Like they're, they might grow slower or they, um, they just might be more stressed out, which is not good. Um, but, but they at least won't just, you know, die right. like, like right. coral reefs, right? We're, we're seeing that bleaching happening everywhere. Yeah. Um, and so, so climate change is a pretty, pretty big deal in that regard. Um, going back to the fact that oysters are generally a flexible organism and they can, they have a, uh, they, they can fit into the environment very easily, especially where in a place where they were naturally from um, and naturally thrived in. Um, and so we, we, we call them ecosystem engineers um, and we're, I feel like at BOP, we're actually re-engineering the ecosystem engineer. <laughs> and, <laughs> <You're doing it. laughs> and that's because, again, most of the waterfront is developed, right? So you don't have, like, um, down south, for example, a lot of their wetland restoration goes hand in hand with oyster restoration. Um, but we don't have a lot of, we, I mean, we used to have a lot of wetlands and there are great groups throughout the city that are trying to restore as many wetlands as possible to make a more resilient and uh, dynamic edge. Um, but the fact is we don't really have as, if we could only install oysters where there are wetlands, it would, it would kind of suck. <laughs> but the, the beautiful thing is that we can put oysters in structures and put them in places. So right. we don't have to rely on, we don't have to recreate the traditional sense of oyster reefs. We, right. can, we can design it and we can actually create structures to put them in and hold them in. And whether they're suspended in the water or they're on the bottom floor, we can create those, those environments for them. For example, we can wrap them around pilings and there's tons of piers, tons of piers and pilings throughout the city. Um, mm -hmm. We can, of course, put them on the bottom. The, the problem with putting oysters on the bottom is we have a lot of soft sediment, and so they can mm -hmm. get buried. But then we could create tall structures so that they're raised up off the bottom and still on the bottom. So it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of funny. Right, but, right. Yeah. But so, um, so climate change in that regard has um, an impact, but we, we have a lot of tools to, to work with to keep going. Um, and that's the same with like sea level rise. Yeah. Uh, the, the landscape, the shoreline is going to change, but that doesn't mean that we can't install oysters. It just means we'll just have to 
design something new or something different or you know work with local agencies and developers and landscape designers and really figure out how to fold in oyster restoration <laughs> into everything um, because it can be done it's just you know time and money of course so yeah of course <laughs> it's so easy things we're so lucky that oysters are such adaptive little guys that's they are so adaptive that's a perfect word and I forgot to use it <laughs> perfect word though well, I got to use it so I, I appreciate you giving me one good word to use after that <laughs> education is sort of your one of your legacies you know your work yeah. is your legacy but your education and the people that you're teaching and getting involved become your legacy too which is amazing yeah exactly. so we always like to wrap up with asking your favorite tip for sustainable living it could have to do with you know your work with billion oyster or just in general something for our our community to uh, take away from you today yeah um so um I also work at the School of Visual Arts. So I teach, um, I teach in the fall semester world energy, in the spring semester conservation biology. And um, depending on enrollment, the summer class can, can be a little wonky. But um, this, this summer I was supposed to teach breaking down sustainability. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a new class. So unfortunately it didn't get to happen this summer, but I'm hoping next summer it does. And so I also teach um, all of my students about aligning your lifestyle with your morals, you know, so um, however you want to live your life, right? It, it, I'm not trying to stress or pressure anybody to ad adapting and embracing veganism or, um, you know, only buying from secondhand stores or something. Um, but I do want to make them aware of their choices as a consumer in our world and what consequences come out of those choices so that people are informed consumers and they're they're making the decision that they actually want to make um, that supports mm -hmm. whatever they believe in or whatever they um, whatever progress they want to see so i would say those are two of my biggest tips being an informed consumer knowing what you're buying knowing who is getting your money um, and of course, aligning, uh, uh, like being an informed consumer, also knowing what negative impacts are coming out of those choices. So are you, are you a pro environment and you want to tackle climate change and um, all of these you know, pressing issues, but do you buy from, from you know, fast fashion trend, like fast fashion stores? And um, so a lot of people, a lot of my students don't um, know about fast fashion, like the really negative impacts, even environmentally and socially. So um, they're always kind of like their jaw drops and they're like, I'm never buying from this store or that store. I'm only going to go to Buffalo Exchange. <laughs> but yeah, so they, um, they're usually really surprised about fast fashion and um, some of the other things that are just so folded into our society that you don't think twice about. Um, and you know, that's our cultural norms for you. So, so that's how everything's built. Um, and you have to break those habits and live the lifestyle that you want and that you support and that you're proud of and whatever that is, you should do, or, you know, you should feel empowered to do. And yeah, just being informed along the way. And of course, being an informed voter, like if you're again, pro climate change and you want to tackle these things, know who you're voting for. So just stressing those two big points is, I feel like covers everything almost. <laughs> yeah, it really does. I mean, you're asking them to look at it in a holistic way and to be aligned and be a holistic, sustainable warrior, if you will. You know, it, your vote matters, your dollar matters. And yeah. that's a huge tip, huge tip. So thank yeah. you so much for sharing it. Yeah, of course. And with that, I will so much Danielle um thanks for talking to us I learned so much personally I know our viewers did too and everyone watching make sure you head over to the Billion Oyster Project website to learn more whether you're a, a hungry volunteer or a hungry <laughs> just want to eat a good oyster or <laughs> yes or exactly yeah head on over learn some more and um see how you can get involved and we'll see you next time mm -hmm.